Right, good afternoon to you all. We're, we're here together and I want to share a few thoughts and ideas about what the future might look like to kick us off. There's some really interesting speakers who follow me coming from all sorts of different angles. I want to talk about the rising tide of automation, more particularly the rising tide of automation as it affects work and, and how we make our livings and how society works. And if you like, the amount of automation that's going on at the moment is going to lead us to a, a new renaissance, a second uh, industrial revolution, and it's well underway already and has been for about 20 years. And we're now seeing the rapid uptake of the, uh, of the consequences of these robots. This is a traditional sort of uh, robot. You might see it in a, in, a, in a plant. And these are the sort of robots we're now seeing. They're unmanned vehicles of one sort or another. We're hearing more about them all the time. The, the uh, bottom right-hand corner is a robot that's just started taking classes in Abu Dhabi in a school. Uh, it also looks after special needs children in that school. There's 18 of those robots going in. The United States is planning to have fairly substantially sized uh, drones, pilotless aircraft, around about 10,000 in their, uh, their airwaves, in their airlines, in uh, 2018. So literally three years away, 10,000 aircraft will be flying around without pilots on board. I'm rather hoping I won't be one of the passengers. The top left-hand one is an octocopter that's delivering school books to kids in uh, a university in uh, Sydney, and that's been running now for two years. So Prime may be bringing their service to bear, but it's already running in some cities and using some really interesting technology, and the Dubai government is also using it to deliver state documents to people in the street and using facial recognition to determine if that's the appropriate recipient of the parcel. So some really interesting tech that's developing. The top right-hand corner is a tractor. Uh, I don't know if any of you are interested in tractors. Uh, I'm not particularly, but there was an uh, 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 anniversary of Voltra in Finland, and they asked me to speak. And they launched, amid lots of uh, dry ice and fanfare, uh, their new concept of the tractor of the future. Well, there we are. That's what it is. And one of the optional extras is a cab for a human being. So what we have is a world that's being designed for machines, uh, not for people, as we move forward. So that's really the point of that. You may have seen these sorts of things endlessly showing a sort of timeline, an increasingly rapidly, rapid rate that we adopt technology. If you ask somebody to adopt new technology in the future, uh, we become very frightened, fearful, worried, concerned. But actually, if you look at the past, we absorb technology into our lives unbelievably easily. And of course, in this one, you've got nine months, Facebook reached 50 million users. But more interestingly, there's Angry Birds that made it in 35 days. So the rate at which we adopt things is accelerating in our lives, and we need to accept that as we go forward. I want to share three horizons of technology very quickly, because that's not the point of this talk. I want to talk about what are the implications for our lives and our work and the way we run our societies. So, of course, mobile technologies, we've had mobile devices, let's call it a telephone for the sake of argument. The telephone turned into a small computer in your pocket. The small computer in your pocket has now turned into a sensor. And every time those things are relabeled, whole industries collapse and whole new industries emerge. And that's where we are with these techs. 3D printing is going to hollow out most people's businesses and provide fantastic opportunity for personalization, for convenience, for uh, unique fabrication. Uh, big data analytics is the big deal that I'm going to come to in a moment. And I'm not going to go through all these one by one, but internet, cloud, and cloud is because we can get access to new capability and new data very rapidly and deploy it very rapidly. Telematics and wearables are the next big thing in terms of, of what we wear and, and how it senses how well we are and what we're doing and who we're doing it with. And ultimately, of course, it moves into smart cloth and all that tech suddenly disappears. And we don't notice we're engaging with technology in our lives. That's what's happening now. So if you ask many companies, in one way or another, these techs are maturing. So what's coming next? Holographics in everything because it gets rid of the need for an awful lot of raw materials. Automation of nearly everything that we currently do as human beings. Unmanned autonomous vehicles en masse. Uh, right now they're, they're in trial mode. Cognitive computing, i.e. computers behaving more like human beings. I'm not quite sure why you'd want that. But now we'll have computers that have emotion that can share the uh, same sorts of senses and feelings as human beings. Haptics, i.e. the sense that you are talking to a hologram that is 3D, that is color, and you can feel the hologram as being real. And these sort of haptic devices are coming very close. And RNA is a line of science that informs DNA in terms of what it's going to do and what it does. So lots of new technology coming there. Um, I will slow down in a minute to talk about some things I really want to get to. But this is the, the sort of ordinary stuff that we need to get through first. And if you like, Horizon 3 is quantum computing, which is orders of magnitude more power than right now we know what to do with. But as soon as it comes out, it'll be too slow. Because every time we get new technology, we exhaust 
its capacity very rapidly. Prescriptive analytics, because predictive analytics we're struggling with right now, prescriptive will say, with the data that we know of what's going on around us, we can make propositions, and prescriptive tells us what those propositions are and how we respond to consumers' and individuals' needs in a proactive way. So life is going to get really interesting. So sharing data for the right reasons with the right people is going to be something we might want to do. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff on the screen I'm not going to particularly talk to. But of course, 3D microscale printing finally allows us to print kidneys and hearts and, uh, and various other organs uh, that we will need to live very much longer lives uh, and have replacement tech available to us very easily with using our own DNA. Uh, the only problem, of course, is installation as ever. You know, that's not a home thing you can do. Having produced your own new heart, you can't put it in very easily. So there's lots of interesting new science coming, coming that will change what we do. And one of the things that I've come across after about 35 years of working in IT is that with each new te technology, first we do things differently, then we do different things. Uh, and they are massively worlds apart in terms of what they mean. I'll give you an example. If we took the example of a tin can, tin cans were used by the Royal Navy to travel further and keep people well. And that was 1810. And it took 48 years to invent a tin can opener. And of course, what we did was use old technology, which was a dagger or a knife or a sword or an axe, and chop the lid off. Then somebody realized perhaps we could do slightly better than that uh, and invented the tin can opener, which looked a lot like that. And everyone thought, sort of duh, isn't that obvious? And that's the point. We, we use new technology to do old things. And actually, what it's allowing us to do very much new things. So what has this meant in terms of work? If you follow these lines, these are from the United States. Uh, the top line is the GDP of, of the US, i.e. the economic output of the US. And the bottom line is the average income per family. And what you can see is through automation over the last 35 years, the, the, the nation, if you like, the unit, we just use that for the moment, has it been increasingly um, generating more wealth. Yet, uh, we haven't been sharing that with humans in the same way. Uh, and that's what this is all about. We are going to increasingly share the wealth of a nation. And I'm saying that in quotes because, quite frankly, the nation ultimately isn't necessarily going to be the, the most important thing. But let's just use that for the moment. So wealth generation and income per family are, are becoming strangers. And what that means is over time, we've had these waves of technology come in. And they've been displacing people in those traditional roles. And we've been doing new things. The good news is we have been doing new things. It's not like we've had those predictions that were there in the 50s that we would all have masses of leisure time. Uh, that didn't work out. And it's very unlikely to work out this time. Because in many ways, we don't want lots of leisure time. We actually want gainful employment. We want to be gainfully uh, put to work, if you like. But not necessarily in the old ways. Uh, not in the, the slightly more abusive ways. Thomas Frey is predicting in the next few years that two billion people, that's a third of the world's working population, will lose their jobs. So an enormous change going on. I'll talk to that a little bit more. So we've been automating manual work. That's obvious. We have road diggers and, uh, and all the things that you would do and combine harvesters and all the things that we used to do with lots of labor. Uh, and we've automated those and will continue to do even better. Clerical tasks, when computers first came in, that was the first things we had put their minds to, adding up numbers, doing ledgers, producing output for companies. Then we started using computers to make decisions. And it's a bit like going to the bank for a loan. Computers say, no, terribly sorry, goodbye. So we used very, very simplistic um, decision-making tools. And now we're replacing professionals with rather more complex decisioning. Uh, and that's beginning to happen in a certain number of professions. So th this is a, an ongoing, continuous trend, and it's now becoming, as I say, quite, quite interesting. If you look at knowledge work in the world, the forecast is in the next 15 years, 40% of knowledge work jobs will be replaced by technology. That's quite a sizable number of people who thought they had a future in that world that no longer exists. And essentially, this is a bottom up. That's why I call it the rising tide, because the more junior things that we used to do to become the creative, wonderful, expensive lawyer or the expensive professional in any area, we won't be doing those tasks any longer. So it begs the question, how do we get the experience to become the expensive, wonderful, leading person? And there's some ways we might do that. If you look at the UK, for example, and Germany, if you think of sort of the knowledge economy, the internet of things, the consequence of all that data and information being used in a way that's productive, you can see in the UK, and Deloitte are confirming this recently, about a third of all jobs are going to disappear. And this is in the next uh, five years. Not 35 years. This is happening now. And in Germany, the Bruegel Institute is talking about half of German jobs 
going in a similar sort of time frame. There is no time to lose to address the issue that jobs are being replaced uh, by machines and people are being replaced by machines. Enormous numbers of people will be displaced that perhaps thought they had a job, not necessarily for life, but at least for the next decade or so. The other thing about this technology is quite fun in some ways, is that management people who manage things and organizations are, are finding it very hard to keep up with new tech. And the arguments are that technology is moving about three to five times faster than technology, so, so than, than management thinking. So we have a really interesting uh, dilemma between the folk who, who run organizations uh, and lead people forward into what's coming next and the technology itself, this wave of technology it's hitting uh, health industries, uh, bio uh, industries, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, engineering firms, automotive, in different ways, an enormous uh, quantity and impact. So what else? Let's talk about where this is going. One of the things we're getting now is about 200,000 more robots in the traditional ones, the very first ones I put up every year. And we've got about 1.5 billion robots in the world working away, doing various things already. So these things aren't new, and they're now getting legs, and they're moving, and they're having facial expression and understanding tone of voice uh, and responding to your needs and delivering things to your table in restaurants and taking orders and looking after you in domestic circumstances. Uh, and these humanoid robots are rapidly increasing uh, and going to be very familiar in our lives, particularly, if you like, in retail and service industry. And of course, it's the service industry in so many ways that's going to be overwhelmed by tech, because the service industry relies on knowledge and information, and it relies on human beings delivering that. So this is an interesting one to watch. And as it says up there, one in 25 people in the labor force in Japan are already robots. So it's not a futurist tale, it's a now tale. And interestingly enough, 60% of, of CEOs uh, don't believe that automation will replace people. So sometimes we can't rely on the very people you think will be on top of these issues uh, to think that the change will come. So, what's next? Lawyers and physicians, uh, medical folk, and some of the more senior people in professions are at the most risk of being displaced. Uh, of course, Watson, the IBM artificial intelligence, uh, is now replacing um, diagnosis of complex um, ailments uh, and is proved to be more accurate in a first instance it's being used for diagnosing uh, lung cancers, uh, and human beings uh, come out second in terms of their accuracy. Uh, predicting markets and, and financial circumstances are also coming out second. So many of the things that we spent a lifetime becoming good at, machines are becoming uh, excellent very quickly, not least of all their learning systems, they're not programmed systems. So they have the ability to rapidly acquire knowledge and apply that knowledge based on the experience uh, of what um, the outcomes are. So really interesting challenge for the middle class, these delightful folk are the older folk in our society. We've got one in six right now are over 65 in the UK. By 2050, and I can't see you out there because it's very dark, but I suspect uh, by 2050, that's another 35 years. Uh, so uh, the over 65s will be one in four. So we're very rapidly aging. The average age in Europe is 43. So we're getting ready for a midlife crisis. The average age in India is 25. They're just going to work. So you've got some really interesting dimensions going on around the place. And of course, this aging society, aging workforce, is moving through very rapidly, uh, and we're very likely to have about 30% of the people in this room will be working beyond 70, 75, maybe even 80. Uh, and if Aubrey de Grey's has it his way that we'll all live to be two or three or 400 years, you'll be working till you're 200, 200, 250. So there we are. Or you're going to save up for a pension that will last 200 years, and good luck with that. <laughs> so we've got some really interesting dynamics going on on all fronts. So that's the aging side of things. Um, the machine-to-machine, -machine, the second economy, as it's called, the computer-to-computer -computer dialogue is beginning to happen. There's about um, um, 10 billion connected devices in the world now. By the end of this decade, five years' time, there'll be 50 billion at least. There's over a trillion sensors being connected, every piece of road furniture, street furniture, drain, manhole cover, every device with an RFID tag are all communicating where they are and what they're next to and where they're moving to and what their condition is. And all that information is being scooped up and used to provide unbelievably rich insights into the, the world around us. And if you just take $7.6 trillion US as the, the equivalency for that world, uh, as has been calculated, that represents about 100 million jobs. So that's 100 million jobs simply gone because that economy is overwhelming human beings. Now, I, I, before you go away with any sense this is a negative view, um, it isn't. This is a, I said right at the beginning, we're very good at adapting 
if, if you look in hindsight. But if I tell you of all these changes coming, then we will freak out and be very upset. Uh, and I don't want you going away from here being concerned or anxious in any way about this. Systems need to change around us. The way that we learn, the way that we support each other, the way that we work, the way that we share income from a nation are going to have to change very rapidly. Almost, if you like, we're going to have to prepare ourselves in a very different way for a different future. So the skills we think we need to acquire, the knowledge we need to acquire, are, are not really that necessary given the way the world's moving. So we, think, we need to think very carefully about the careers we're going to enter into, or very rapidly rise with the tide, because the tide's happening now, to become the senior person to have longevity in a career. So all, all I'm advising, and the reason I chose this talk for, for this audience, is really to think very carefully about the impact of, of big data and analytics and prescriptives and, and all those other texts I talked about on the industries or the careers you want to follow and say, how will that impact that uh, um, industry and, and will it actually mean the skills I've acquired are, are going to no longer be required? So it, the good news is human beings are very good at being human beings. And I know that's a bit of an extremely obvious statement, but we're very good at thinking, we're very good at emotion, we're very good at creativity, we're very good at art, artistic creation, we're very good at negotiating, we're very good at sales, we're very good at, at discussing the nuances of requirements. So there is going to be a role for human beings for a very long time at the top of the tree of this automation. But we need to think and imagine what is that going to be like uh, and what skills do I have to acquire in, in order to be relevant as I go forward. So being creative, uh, being, uh, being a great communicator, uh, being a great collaborator, the things that human beings like doing uh, is going to stand you in good stead. If a lot of this change is, is a little bit depressing, uh, and if a lot of this change is challenging, uh, it's true. We need to change the taxation systems because very few people will be working. And there'll be lots of other people who maybe aren't required. Now, we can't have a system where the very few have huge incomes and the very, uh, the very many uh, are left to flounder uh, in, our, in our society. So this is a major societal shift we're going through, and we're going to have to very clearly readapt a lot of our institutions and forms of governance and governing so that we share the wealth of the nation with people in a reasonable way without proclaiming communism, but in a way that seems reasonable, uh, and we're participants, and we're engaging, and we're helping that society become more successful. And my final thought here is the concept of income and personal income is going to be challenged. How much do I need before whatever I'm generating with all the machines around me and the systems can go somewhere else for somebody else's benefit? Do we call that taxation? Because if, you, if someone's income is 14 million pounds because they're at the top of the tree of this, which is a ludicrous large amount of money, is it reasonable to say we'll cap you at 14 million and the 80 million you generate a year in, in value for your firm goes somewhere else? Anyway. Welfare will need to change for those same reasons, and of course volunteering will need to help people engage in this society in a way that's meaningful and also to get value for themselves. So thank you very much.